All right. So, hey, everybody, thank you very much for coming today, whether you're in person on this glorious day here in Tacoma, or if you are online watching, or if you're watching this six months later, hey, I don't care. Hey, thanks very much for coming. Today, we're going to be chatting about a fun a topic that is, it's not just Italian, but we're going to focus a little bit more on Italian side of it. So today we're going to be talking about, how do you say it, Doug? Doug, yell it out. Carrozzeria. There you go. He says it so much better than the rest of us. So the joy is, is that what that means, if we get this slide to move, is, come on slide, there it is. Question is, what exactly does that word mean? It basically is the word for the body makers for the cars, whether it was carriage makers, coach makers, car, it's the body makers you know, for the uh, car itself. Now, a lot of these places didn't just make the bodies. They would design them. They'd make one off or two off. But some of them, if we can get the thing to go, hey, sometimes they make just one off absolutely stunningly beautiful cars. So in this case, hey, that car, they only made one off. It was done by Pininfarina. Sometimes when they do it, it is... I'm going to break this thing. All right. Uh, sometimes they do short runs. Um, so they're going to do a car that's a, a very limited production. It could be, you know, it doesn't, it could be a, you know, a couple hundred. The point is, is that, you know, there is, they're, they're not just one size fits all. Um, the other one could be a little bit longer run. So you might recognize this car. This car happens to be sitting upstairs in the museum right now on display. The owner of it sitting in this audience. Does anybody want to wave their hand if they own this car? Yeah, I see them out there. So you guys can't see them out there, but trust me, they're here. So, uh, so the point is, is they they weren't just making one car; they were make, sometimes making a number. Now, the trick is, is it wasn't just Italy that was doing this. Um, England had a, a large number of different uh, body makers. In their case, they would refer to them as coach or carriage makers. Um, but uh, James Young, for example, was a, a company that uh, was very popular in England, making bodies for Rolls Royce, Bentley, Sunbeam, Talbot, um, and Freestone and Webb also. Uh, around 1923 to 1963, for about 40 years there, they were making uh, lots of cars, including <clears throat> a few Alfa Romeos. Because people would buy an Alfa Romeo, they'd bring it to England, and they'd say, hey, I want to have this personalized for me. So these are different companies that would not only do it for the factory, but they'd do it for a person and they would do a custom design body for them. So not a, a horrible concept. Um, Moulinaires was also a company, did a lot of uh, high-end luxury cars. Then after a while, Rolls-Royce took their name and actually used it to apply to special edition uh, Rolls-Royces. And they're usually I mean, if Rolls-Royce is already pretty nice, this was a high-end version of a Rolls-Royce. Uh, Van den Plas started in Belgium, but they also were a body maker there in England. They would usually not start from scratch. They would just modify what was there. And so you have the Van den Plas version of the Jaguar or whatever it might be. Uh, a lot of times it was just a trim level, but it wasn't their only limit. They usually would uh, you know, give the customer the option if they hadn't deep enough pockets, boy, they'd cut the, the car up a little bit and make new body panels. So um, that's also Radford, one of my favorites, uh, Radford and Company, uh, because Radford did Bentleys, but they also did Minis. Not too many Austin Minis out there that are the Radford Minis, but when you see one, boy, you know it. If you could picture an Austin Mini that's a luxury car, <laughs> the, the Radfords were the luxury end of an Austin Mini. Um, they also did Aston Martins, and uh, heck, come to think of it, Radford was busy in the 60s. They were helping make the very first Ford GT40, um, because as they were producing that car, Radford was you know, available, and they helped make some body panels and some of the metal work for that car. So it wasn't just England. Come on, thing. Um, France. Ugh right there in second place in my book behind Italian car designers is French car designers. I don't always love their cars. I don't always want to buy them, but oh my God, I'm impressed by the stuff they come up with. Um, and if you think of French car designers, probably the, the single most dramatic 
over the top car designer was the firm of Fagoni Falashi. Um, their cars, example here is a Delahaye uh, 135M, always had those beautiful dramatic lines to them. You know, so when you go to buy a Delahaye, you could buy a, a body by a countless different people on that very same car. But the Fagoni Falashi cars, they were the ones that were just completely over the top and amazing. And of course, this one I just happened to look at last week from the uh, Mullen Museum down in uh, California. So, um, but Fagoni also did a few Alfa Romeos, 8C 2300s back then. They looked very much like the Zagato, very much like the Touring, but they had their own slightly smooth lines to the uh, same basic body shape. So, Fagoni wasn't afraid of doing Italian cars. He was actually Italian by birth, but hey, at age eight years old, he moved across the border and started living in Paris with his family and uh, never went back to Italy. So uh, um, next we have, um, so Jacques Sauchik um, made many cars and most of them were pretty amazing, but nothing as dreamlike as the uh, Xenia. The Xenia is a Hispano Suiza uh, built for the Dubonnet group. Dubonnet had been successful with all sorts of uh, car parts and racing things and suspensions on a few Alphas. Um, but this car was a special order. Lo and behold, Sauchik made it for him. Absolutely, there's not an angle on it that's not crazy and dramatic. Um, that's, how, that's what you get from a French uh, body maker. And you can see they spell it very similarly. You look at the top of the slide, you notice that it's not spelled exactly the same as the Italians, but boy, it's obviously the same word. And uh, so then you uh, talking about Delahaye's and the body makers. I mean, Chaperon made plenty of Delahaye's. Uh, they also made lots of Citroëns and things. A great, a lot of great cars, very fun. This case happens to be my boss driving the Delahaye down there at Pebble Beach. Um, so that's a Delahaye 135S going by right before the engine blew. Oh, oops, sorry, don't, you guys don't capture that. I don't want the boss to know I was laughing. Um, so there's also other sp fun specialty companies. Um, so hiding over there, Hulies, that's how, that's how I say it. We'll, we'll trust that it's close. Uh, especially the company that did uh, a number of little one-off projects or short-run projects, but they also took on some uh, very fun things, including they produced all of the Peugeot 205 T16s, which are an amazingly fun little car. And you'll see that in the, the gray car up at the top of the slide. The little red car in the middle, they also produced all the Renault R5 turbos because Renault produced the, you know, could, could create the overall design of the car. But that didn't fit their assembly line, nor did that Peugeot fit Peugeot's assembly line. So they come to a special body maker and say, hey, will you make this? And they make the body and they assemble all the pieces onto it that Peugeot or Renault supplies. Now, it doesn't stop them from every once in a while getting crazy and doing their own crazy, you know, hypercar, which they did relatively recently. That's like within 10 years ago, they produced that. So anyway, point is, is they're, they're out there for their special reasons and they're having fun. When you go to Concours events, you'll see cars sometimes with a very dramatic script of a logo. Um, that is the uh, uh, Van Boren uh, little uh, logo. Uh, Achille Van Boren bodied lots of dramatic cars, including this happens to be a Bugatti Type 57. And there's not a Bugatti Type 57 that's not worth a whole ton of money they're all beautiful they're all crazy and a lot of times a little different so again very fun fun bunch of uh, cars so there's a lot more body makers in france uh, but you go across the border uh, down into germany now germany didn't make the dramatic lines that italy or france would make but they made amazing cars um so uh the trick is that like Carmen, for example, uh, probably the, the biggest company now in, in Germany that's a standalone, or was a standalone uh, body maker, they made the Carmen Gias, uh, whether it was convertible or hardtop, they made all those for Volkswagen. 
they made 2.5 million Volkswagen Beetle convertibles. That is a lot of cars, 2.5 million. Um, so, but every single one was made by Carmen. Volkswagen would make the mechanicals for the engine and the running gear. They would ship that over and to be assembled by Carmen. So Carmen was a large, large company. Um, they also made the Chrysler uh, Crossfire. I know we all, how many people in this room have a Chrysler Cross? Okay, no, nobody, no, anybody online? Maybe. Uh, the point is they were kind of funny, but even if you drove a 79 through 93 Ford Mustang and you had a convertible, that convertible top was made by Carmen and uh, was shipped over to this country to be assembled in the cars. So, I mean, Carmen is a, has always been a very strong, successful company. Um, and we, we've crossed paths with them many, many times we drive down the road with the cars that they've done. So now the next one is, uh, come on thing. So uh, Kinath, I don't know how you exactly say it, but Kinath is a specialty company that uh, did convertibles and station wagons. That was their special niche. So Opel or Mercedes or somebody would make a car four-door sedan and then they'd say hey i um you know i want we want a limited run of station wagons of this we just want 500 of them we want 200 of them or whatever it might be they would then hand it off to them they would take those bodies cut them make a station wagon back and give it back to the fa factory so that way they could sell those at the dealers where the company could focus on selling their cars but they didn't have to middle muddle around with the special little odd short run products. They also did convertibles of cars. So there's weird things. If you want an Opel, Opel GT um, back in the old days, it was very hard to make that a convertible. That's what they did. That was, that, that was their specialty. So very few of them done on some cars, but a lot of other cars, you would never even know it wasn't factory done. Um, AMBI Bud. They were actually back before World War II, they were the largest body maker in Germany, making bodies for a lot of different cars. They were very state-of-the-art steel work. Um, they could do, you know, had huge plant doing all sorts of stuff. But unfortunately, after World War II, they were heavily damaged and to be worse, they were on the wrong side of the Berlin Wall. So <laughs> There went their business. They didn't have anything to do on the on the safe free side of the wall. And on the other side of the wall, they, I don't know, they may be stamping out a few Travants or something, but they weren't making a lot of cars. However, they did survive. And when the Berlin Wall came down in 1999, they went back to business. They got bought by Thias and Krupp, and they are actually still making body panels for cars. It's just kind of funny to see something just bad timing for them. They were in the, the wrong country in the war on the wrong side of the border afterwards. So uh, um, whatever, we got Bauer, Bauer also. Now Bauer, yeah, they're, they're a unique bunch. Up in the upper corner, there's a little red uh, BMW shown on that slide. Bauer specialty was doing, again, convertibles for the regular cars. So if the factory didn't want to make convertibles, if you notice that BMW is a four door with a very unique, top to it. And that was their specialty. They also made Targa top BMWs. You can find the old BMW 2002s and things that have a, a unique Targa roof to them. That was Bauer making those. So they made thousands of cars for BMW and others, but they were, they were unique. They were definitely, I think that's a way to say it's unique. Um, then you've got Hepmuller. Hepmuller made Volkswagen Beetles before Carmen did it. They made the convertibles. If you've got one of those, those bad boys are worth at least $300,000 nowadays because they're, they only made 696 in the world and they're very cool. If you see them in a museum, you're like, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on here? It's very different. But that was uh, just another example of a car that Volkswagen would make the car and Hebb Mueller would say, oh, we've customized it for you. And they'd make a bunch of them. And, into convertibles or into a special coupe. So anyway, very fun to see. Different company, different countries had their uh, different process and different uh, you know, makers. North America wasn't alone. They I mean, it wasn't uh, out of it. Fisher Body is by far the single largest body maker in the United States back in the day. They were, they were huge. Um, and 
so that was all the way up until 1990 because uh, you know with, up to 1990 your car would have a little sticker somewhere in it that said body by fisher if you bought a gm car ah but in 1990 gm bought them after 82 years of being a partner um so they took him over um so now you know it's just part of gm as, as at this point willoughby was a company making luxury limousines in this country there was a, a lot of, of, of companies I mean, the, it's like at least this list of people plus 30 it's a bunch of different companies out there but Willoughby made limos for the out of Lincoln's Packard's um, and of course the depression not only ended their business it ended quite a few other of body makers in this country because they were they were a high-end side of the car business uh, Ford and others focused on the basic car and if you wanted a fancy version thing you'd call one of these companies so a company like Dietrich Dietrich made bodies for Packard's Franklin's Studebaker's Lincoln um, Fleetwood uh, Metal made uh, bodies for both U.S. and European cars. But then finally in 1925, they got bought out by um, uh, Fisher. And when Fisher bought them, Fisher had them focus on Cadillacs. And so we saw over the years, different Fleetwood editions of the Cadillac. They did, you know, the name Fleetwood just came from the city in Pennsylvania that they started in was Fleetwood, Pennsylvania. So kind of funny. Um, Briggs made company, made bodies for Ford, Lincoln, Mercury, Chrysler, Packard, Hudson. I mean, all sorts of people. Even Marmon uh, was made by them. Uh, they sold out to Ford as all those other car companies were going away and failing because of the depression and things. So they sold out to Ford and became part of the Ford Motor Company. So nowadays we don't really have a litany of specialty body makers in North America. Um, but there is nothing in the world that compares to Italy. Italy, I mean, this is just a short list. I mean, and there are plenty more. There were so many in, in Turin alone, I think there was like 50 different people making bodies. If you go to the Biscaretti Museum and you walk through this one room, there's a glass lit up floor where all these cars are parked. And it's like an aerial view of Turin. And there's little tags everywhere for what designer was here, what designer was there, it's all over the place. It's, it's funny. And you realize suddenly, wow, they, this was the industry uh, in that town. So very, very, very cool. Um, but, uh, you know, well, before I change slides, since it doesn't like to go anywhere, uh, Italy, there were plenty of designers before World War II, but after World War II, that was a perfect time to be a design company in and a specialty body maker in Italy. Because after the war, there's so many places in Europe that were damaged. They didn't have a huge amount of money to both rebuild their, their facilities and do research and development and produce cars. So they spent the money on where they had to rebuild their facilities and produce the basic cars. And they outsourced the design or the development efforts and who was standing there ready to go? A bunch of Italian car companies saying, hey, we'll design that. Hey, we'll do that. That was their specialty. So it was, it was a perfect time to do it. There was also, because the war had gone on for a little while, a lot of cars were, well, seven, eight years, 10 years behind the design times. And so they needed to refresh. Everybody needed to re refresh. And uh, so that it was a perfect time to be a designer in uh, uh, in Italy. Um, so we'll start focusing on the Italians here. First one is Bertone. Bertone is a phenomenal company. Um, the trick is, is that Giovanni Bertone opened his first company back in 1912. Um, his son Nuccio joined in 1933. Um, and uh, the designer Mario Ravelli de Beaumont uh, came along as well as a designer. In 1942, they designed their first phenomenal Alfa Romeo, the 6C2500 Coupe Lurani. And uh, so this one, I think Doug out here in the audience knows this car. He's seen it a couple of times in person. Uh, it sits in the uh, Lepresto collection, if I'm not mistaken. Um, beautiful car. What's funny is that 
they practiced before they did the alpha, they did a Fiat first. Over in the little lower corner here is a little picture of the Fiat 1500 uh, Ravelli. That was the same basic car on the surface. So the body, again, these guys are working for our factories. The factory provides the mechanicals. They're doing the outside. So they had the Fiat mechanicals. They did the body. Hey, this looks cool. Hey, we'll do another one. We'll do an alpha. <laughs> so that's how this, that's how this works, especially in Italy. So um, yeah, so it just that's that was the Bertone's first alpha. Um, and uh, then they went on, uh, so that came the Julietta Sprints. Now this, when they not only designed it, they, they were able to produce them and that car was so successful. Oh my goodness, huge amount of money comes in for both Alpha and for Bertone. So it was a great, great cash cow right there. Beautiful car, we all like it, the, the cars, but oh, good for the companies. Now sitting next to it happens to be the Spider. Now they, they designed a Spider as well, they suggested it. But Alpha did not choose that. They chose the Pininfarina and went that direction on the Spider. But hey, cool car nonetheless. Um, but there, but now with all the extra money in their hands, the Berton was able to start spending on other fun things and other fun projects. So out comes the Bat cars. So you got Bat five, seven, and nine. Franco Scaglione created these things and he they're absolutely amazing crazy cars both in person or in pictures um the first bat five you ever wonder why it was called bat five how many people know the reason why it was bat five not bat one not bat two not even three or four well the answer is because they made four models out of clay and when they finally said okay this looks good we're like this let's make this out of metal the first one out of metal was bat five and well, that was kind of cool. They said, now we have bat five. <laughs> and then they made another model to make bat six. Oh, that was just out of clay, but like, let's do a real one. So when they made it out of metal, it was that they called it by its name. So bat five, bat seven, bat nine, and phenomenal cars. What's cool is they didn't have real high tech uh, aerodynamic you know, tools. They didn't have wind tunnels that they could easily test. So they did the best they could, um, but they did pretty darn well. The Bat 5, their very first attempt, um, which is the, high, the gray one way off to the far side, that had a drag coefficient of 0.23. That's pretty darn low, it's pretty darn low. At the time, it was about the lowest drag coefficient you could get out there. Um, Bat 7 beat that. Bat 7 got away with point, uh, 0.19. So they, it was doing really well. I don't remember what bat nine uh, was. Uh, I can't remember, but it, it actually went back up a sliver. Um, but the point is, is that all of them are extremely low drag coefficients. That's lower than your typical, you know, Porsche you see driving on the road today or something, you know, it's like, it's very impressive. So nice thing about all that money from the uh, selling those little, Julietta Sprints is they could afford to do things like this. So every time you see a Sprint, you can smile and thank them because they helped pay for the <laughs> some of the other toys that came along. Um, the Sprint Special was a descendant of those back cars. They took some of the lines and the looks and the aerodynamics that they did on that car and they created the uh, the Sprint Special. Now, of course, the one on the red in the left here is the uh, um, low nose version, one of the early low nose, and then the white one's a standard front. But those cars um, had about a 0.28 drag coefficient. So they were still pretty darn, darn good. And all of this is early on in, again, aerodynamic, you know, testing and technology. So, so what would come next would be a great thing, but well, that'd be a, a car we just might recognize, the GTV. So the red uh, GTV up there, typical GTV, just a beautiful car. The convertible version below it is the GTC and the Montreal. All of these were phenomenal designs that came along and they had money for this kind of development. And now they had success with more cars. And so again, this was a heyday for, for Berton. Um, they, uh, 
I mean, back then at that point, they were also doing the Fiat 124 Spider, and those things were all successful cars. They were doing 120 cars a day out of their factory. So it's just pretty impressive. But kind of this isn't the fact. This is an Alpha. This is Bertone doing this. I mean, it, there was a huge operation going on. So um, Kangoro. Kangoro was designed. This is basically uh, Giorgetto Gujaro. How do you say Gujaro's name? Giugiaro. Giugiaro. Okay, I'll, I'll, go, I'll go with Giugiaro. Um, he was still at Bertone at this point. So he was tasked with designing a car that would be a street version of the Alpha TZ. Now, Zagato had designed the TZ and it was a race car. That was its whole purpose. So he took the same mechanicals and he designed this. Now, the only problem was, man, car got destroyed in a fire and then it got left outside. It has thankfully been restored now, finally. Um, but the trick is, is uh, uh, a very unique car. They just never produced them after. They only did the one. Stop right there. Um, so, But it got restored. So, so for anybody online, what you may not have heard is that the the car, when it uh, was rotting away and not being restored, was eventually brought was found and brought to uh, Oregon, where an Oregon Alpha Club member uh, was acquired it and was going to possibly restore it. Never did. Ran out of money. The car went to Japan. It did get restored now at this point. So it was it had a local Northwest connection. So uh, kind of a fun story. Nice to see a life of a car. Um, now, they also had money to do things like this. Bertone created the Carabo. The Carabo was so far ahead of its time. Um, it's based on the Tipo 33 platform. Um, and I mean, it actually runs, it's, you know, it's a phenomenal car. Just the design, the style, everything is just out of this world. Um, at the same time, Bertone also was doing some amazing other cars for other people. So you've got the Lamborghini Mira. I mean, that is, that's a stunning car. The guy's 26 years old as he designs that Mira. Uh, that's amazing to me. Uh, in the lower corner, you got the Lamborghini Marzal, a completely unique vehicle. Um, and, uh, you know, just way outside the box. Uh, in the upper corner, the, the Countach, which we all love our Countach when we see it go by. Nobody wants to drive them, but they are <laughs> phenomenal cars to look at and listen to. And then in the bottom corner, completely outside the box, again, you've got the, the Lancia Stratos prototype. Now, it's funny because the Lancia Stratos real car was completely unrelated, but by God, that thing is crazy. And, and there's only one of those. So so thank you, Bertone, for making things like this for us. Um, now, Bertone was actually, you know, had a number of, of new, fun, specialty things that they did that made them so unique. But you think back in 1932, they made a panoramic windshield. So the panoramic windshield, you know, they didn't have the same technology we have today, but they had the windshield and they had the angled sides to it and little seams. And American car companies said, hey, that's kind of cool. And they started using that on some of their cars, DeSotos and other things came along and stole that concept but they it gave better visibility. Also, it's hard to see it in these pictures, but the headlights are molded in. Up to this point, headlights always just sat up on the front as a standalone piece next to the big flowing fenders. Ah, but if you look, Bertone actually penned these headlights to be molded into the bodywork on the car. So these, again, outside the box ideas that, um, you know, some people, you know, people at the time may have thought about it, but Bertone took it, took it and ran with it. So it's just fun to see the, the body makers and designers trying things. Now, another company that was going on at the time, Carlo Marazzi uh, started in the 60s. And one of his first projects was to build the bodies for one of the most beautiful cars that ever was on this planet, the Alpha 33 Stradale. Um, made all the bodies for those cars. Uh, funny thing is they only assembled a few of those. <laughs> they only assembled, what, nine or 10 of the, uh, of the bodies. So 
there are a few replicas on the planet that actually use a real original bodies, but uh, they only, you know, that that is just an amazing car. Each one they were making, you know, there in Italy at, at uh, Carlos' place. Um, then, you know, you think, yeah, hey, that great for a company that started in the '60s. They were still going strong in 2000s because they then built the Alpha 8C Competizione convertible prototype. So they still were in business at that point and still had the right connections. So they are, uh, oops, come on, thing. Uh, there are a lot of the other companies like Boano. Uh, Boano always had a unique look to their cars. You, I swear you could see a, a Boano car and say you'd know it right off that it was theirs. Um, you, you'd probably be right. Um, so it's just, that's just normal for their, their cars. I mean, the, the one in the upper left corner, that's a 6, 3, 6C 3000 mm. The other or top right corner is 750 Sport. That's typically in the Alpha Museum. And then down at the bottom is the 1900 Primavera. Um, you know, they are, again, Boano did great work, but they are, it was just a very different look to their cars typically. Um, and difference not bad, it's just different. Um, Zagato, so Zagato, that's a hundred years worth of alphas right there. You've got in the upper left corner, that's an alpha from 1911 at the G1 that Zagato created the bodywork for. In the right side, you got the alpha TZ3. Now there's always this argument that <sighs> there's not a lot of alpha to that TZ3 because we know it's a Dodge Viper hiding underneath that skin. But the key is, is that somebody had to work with Alpha and could help convince them, hey, we want to do this thing. We want to put a Chrysler underneath there, a Viper, no less, underneath. And we want to put your name on the outside. And the fact that Zagato was able to pull that off, that's pretty impressive. Um, so very, very fun. It's 100 years of Alpha at Zagato. Now, Zagato has had a great track record of doing a lot of phenomenal cars. but not just alphas. I mean, and they're still busy. They're still doing things. Uh, in the upper left corner, that should be an, an ESO Revolta GTZ. That's you know relatively new, uh, fresh car. Down below, it's an Aston Martin Vanquish shooting brake. Um, then the, uh, <laughs> the the big green cars. Anybody in here knows Peter Gleason? Hey, you've seen that car sitting in his garage. That's the Aston Martin uh, DBAR1. Um, so very few of those were made. And so uh, Zagato's still doing cars. I mean, they, they've had cars in the last yeah, year or two come out. So they're still around. Um, then Zagato did the uh, Alpha RZ and the Alpha SZ. And uh, admittedly, Alpha did much of the design work on this in their own in inside studio. But uh, Zagato was tasked with, as the body maker, doing the actual production of it. Someday, if you ever sit around with a Zagato person close to you, ask them, well, why is it that almost every single panel between the RZ and the SC don't match? They, they, I don't mean you know, between the SCs and the SCs. No, just when they designed it, they went out of their way to design every single panel ever so slightly different. I have no idea why, but they did. So they look like they should match, but they don't. <laughs> so anyway, very fun stuff. And one of those is hiding upstairs right now in the museum, a part of the display. So um, the Zagato Zeta 6. Now, any of us who loved our GTV6s, this was always a little dream car in the back of our mind. When we were driving our GTV6, we thought it was this. But the Zeta 6 is just a, a beautiful one-off car. <laughs> that they they created that'd be their example of what the gtv6 should have looked like and i mean if they all looked like that i'd probably be lusting after the uh, the gtv6 that i drive right now that guajario designed but still the trick is i like it <laughs> it's just another example of what you can do with the uh, same platform so of course zagato was responsible for the julietta sz that's hiding down here they did the TZ1 up straight above and then the TZ2 off to the side. These things are phenomenal uh, cars. One of the tricks is that they're extremely lightweight construction. So as they made these cars, the goal was to say, let's go racing. 
So they had to make the cars strong enough to survive racing, but light enough to be able to go fast with a somewhat small engine in it. And that's what these cars were able to do. So, um, and they look good in the process of doing it, especially that TZ2. Oh my goodness. So another prime example, when they're trying to engineer a car, it's not just the beauty of the car, because Lord knows this car is beautiful. But this car, this is the Alpha 1900 SSZ. We used to have one upstairs in the museum as part of the Alpha display. This car is almost 200 pounds lighter than Touring's light version of the car, the 1900 CSS. And so it's like 200 pounds, but they were able to save 200 pounds in the production. So if you think about it on a small engine car, that makes a big difference on performance. So beauty and efficiency was the key. And uh, so that is, come on thing. That is uh, the fun part. So now they also made uh, some of the, nine, uh, the 8C2300 Monzas were Zagato bodied cars. This happens to be the one in the Simeone Foundation. Um, and then you've got the RLSS Zagato Targa Florio. I you know some people say Targa Florio is named after uh, the Florio family that started the race. But I think actually, I'm not sure, but I think the word is flammable because I watched him start this car and he had two fire extinguishers and you could see fuel going, but beautiful, amazing car, uh, just very different. And at the time, I mean, you think of how, you know, this, this was a very racy car when this thing came out. So, all right, so Florio is after the name of a person. It's not the word flammable. I know better than that, um, but come on. There are some fun things that were done by Zagato. Um, for example, the little red one in the lower corner, that's the uh, Alfa Romeo. That's the, uh, what they call that thing? That is the Alfa Z33 Tempo Libero. Tempo Libero, if I'm not mistaken, means free time. So, so that's your, what you do on your free time is you go push that thing out of the garage, look at it and then push it back in. <laughs> Luckily, it is a one-off car. Um, they also made the little white car up here. Um, that's a Fiat, Fiat 500 Z Eco. Um, it was not very eco, it's, it, it had a gas engine, but it had a bike. So you could ride your car somewhere and then pull the bike off and go. I mean, I heard of bike racks. They obviously hadn't, but hey, that's, that is what they're there for is to have fun designing cool cars. Now, up in the upper left corner, that is altogether crazy. That is the, uh, the Iso de Volta Vision Gran Turismo. That's the video game Gran Turismo. They let the people in the game design a car. And once they got done designing it in game, and it was a large group of people doing it, they, uh, they asked somebody to make it. But lo and behold, there it is. The Gato made, made a couple of them and said, there you go. It cost a big chunk of money, but hey, Gran Turismo was, had deep pockets, so away it went. Um, so I just recently bought a miniature of it, and I was horrified when it showed up because it was a 118th scale. That's too big and too dramatic for my display <laughs> to be that car. That's not an alpha. So I had to actually shove it off to the side and give it away. Oh, well, and I am a little biased. So... There are other phenomenal people out there that do crazy things. So Vittorio Viotti uh, started in 1952 and he built this 6C 2500 uh, Giardinetta. The trick is that was his specialty, making these little woody wagons. He did a lot of other things, but when it comes to alphas, they did like 50 alpha and fiats that you know, all this basically the same look. So it was the same car, but you know, the Alphas had a six seat underneath them, and <laughs> the Fiats had a much smaller engine. It's like a 15 or 1600 engine under that. So, can't imagine it was real exciting to drive, but it's unique. So, um, but uh, Fiati is still doing things. I mean, more recently, they did the bodies for the, the W Motors when they wanted to make the Lycan Hypersport crazy four million dollar you know supercar well the Audi is the one that made the bodies for those uh even though 
Furious uh, 7, I think, was the one that crashed it out of the one building through the air and into another building. It was still like an hypersport. Either way, it doesn't matter. So um, I don't think Biotti cared if they wanted to wreck a few. Um, Stola design. The Stola design is so funny. I still carry this little business card from Stola design. It has the uh, Fiat uh, Abarth Monotipo pin on it. Uh, Stola design is a great little funny company. They've been for years, they've been around since like the 19 teens. And they've done all sorts of little piecemeal work for a lot of different companies, including Alfa Romeo. They helped Alfa with the Alfa 156 and things. But uh, um, they also, more recently, the last thing they did was the Alfa Romeo Proteo in 1991, which was a clever car because it actually had a retractable hardtop. Um, back then, that wasn't very common in 91. That was a novel idea. So it was sitting on an Alpha 164 base, and I don't hear any booing from the audience. That's a good sign. You, know, you guys know that I love my Alpha 164s. Um, Stola then made also in the upper or the left hand side, you got the, the Fiat Abarth Monotipo. So that car was made as a gift for Gian, uh, Giannani, Giannani Agnelli for his 80th birthday. And uh, when I was there visiting, they said, yeah, you want to drive it? And I'm like, oh, oh, I don't want this little note going out about headline about American Rex, you know, Agnelli's birthday present. So I said, no, yeah, but I took a ride in it instead. Um, amazing car. All the glass on it's actually not glass. It's some crazy composite. So it's lightweight. And uh, so even though it's got the whole entire roof tapering down all that dark area is all glass. It was light. It's like, hey, clever. I don't know if it scratches, but cool stuff. They also made this really weird little car here called the uh, Dedica or Dedica. A very fun little car based on the Fiat, uh, you know, a little Barchetta. And in fact, both cars are based on the Fiat Barchetta. <laughs> and so the, the red one, they went crazy and did the body altogether different and Abarth up, upgraded the motor. On the Dedica, they changed the motor out for a Lancia uh, upgrade motor. <laughs> so they had fun. And I like that. That's what designers and creative body work people do. They try to figure out what's going to best fit in the body they've designed. So anyway, fun stuff for people to make and play with. Then we slide over to one of the all-time greats in the design world, Pininfarina. Um, so Pininfarina. Their first stunning design, they started in 1930. Their first stunning design that came out is still hard to dispute. It, it is one of the most beautiful lines of any car, the Cheese Italia 202 Coupe. Um, and this picture doesn't do it justice. If you see it in person, you just stare. They're just that nice. Um, so very, very, very cool. Now, Pininfarina had left Stabili, Stab, St how do you say it? Stablementine, Stablementi, Farina meaning his brother's company, he and his two brothers were both, they were all designers. He left there to start his own company. Now, Pinin is just the word, it's like, you know, it's like a little nickname for little, you know, the little Farina. He was the young brother. He was the, you know, the little Farina. Um, so the company's name was Pinin Farina all the way up until Pinin passed away. And when he passed away, they combined the name as his rest of his family continued running it. So that's why if you ever see Pinin Farina as two words, that's prior to what? I think around 1960-ish when, the, uh, when he, the originator passed away. After that, one word, Pinin Farina. So um, let's go, come on thing, there we go. Now Pinin Farina did great. Um, so. The first real money maker as cars. And money makers are important because they pay for all those things. They subsidize all your other fun and bad habits. Uh, we all know that in life. Any of us get a little of bonus money. You know, it sort of subsidizes our bad habits. The beautiful Alfa Romeo, the Julieta Spider, and the Julia as it went forward. Uh, great seller, very successful for both Alfa and for Finna Farina. So, um, We've got the, uh, you know, Finifarina went ahead and invested in a uh, wind tunnel finally. Uh, that was not until 1972, but they, you know, that was 
that was a big chunk of money and they paid for that thanks to sales of alphas and a couple other things. So very, very cool to see that happen. Now they could actually be much more finite with their stuff. But prior to that, Pininfarina made incredibly fun cars still. Um, so you've got the, uh, the 6C3000 Superflow in one of its three iterations up there in the corner. Um, down below it, you got the Julia Sport 1600. Um, that thing is so low. If you stand next to it, it is just, I swear the roof of that car is this high and that's it. Um, same thing goes for the big white Ferrari up there on the top. That's the Ferrari Majulo. Um, they only made one of them. It's sitting on a Ferrari 512 BBI, you know, chassis underneath it. Um, but it's lower than the 512. It's just extremely low. Problem is it never really worked well when they made it. And uh, thankfully now it has been sold and been, somebody said, I want to spend the money to make it drivable. So it actually now is a functioning car. But down below, ah, another one of the most beautiful cars ever designed, the Alfa Romeo Duetto Tanta. And it is a one-off specialty car, you know? Just wish they made that thing. Oh my gosh. Um, so that was some of the fun cars that Finn and Farina did over the years here. But then we slide over to Touring Super Legera. So super, Touring, again, has cars that have lines that just hold. No matter what angle you're looking at, no matter what year you're looking at, and no matter what the weather is, or whether the car is restored or not, there's just something about Touring's lines. And Zagato always tried for that same effect. They just didn't quite hit it always, whereas Touring has the ability to pull it off. So their first big alpha success was that, and this is only, they'd only been in business for a short time, was that white Alfa Romeo up there, the 6C, 1750, um, the Flying Star. And they made a few of those. Um, then the big blue car, some of you might recognize, that used to be in our area around here. That's the Alpha 8C 2900B Lungo. Um, there was a total of five of those made. Um, and you just, again, from every angle. And what's funny is that car wins best to show a pebble. 10 years later, another one of the five goes down there, wins best to show a pebble. And uh, it's like, clearly, it is hard to look away from what Touring designs. And at the same time, it's all lightweight. It's on, the, they, they use their super legera uh, technique, which is they got the little small little metal, uh, you know, uh, wires that are basically very thin. And that thin aluminum sheet metal is just wrapped around those shapes. And it is very, very nicely done and very light. So as big as that car was, it was actually pretty, pretty lightweight. So very, very cool to see. Um, that down in the corner, you might recognize that happens to be a car that's sitting in the lobby upstairs right now as part of the display. It's modeled after Touring's 8C Spider look and feel. So if you like the look and feel, just go look at it up there. Yes, that one was made locally, but the look and what it's modeled after is touring all the way. Good choice. To, if you're going to choose somebody to, to model after, touring's a good one. Um, now, touring made a number of other cars. In the upper uh, left corner, that's one of the 60 2500 uh, Villa That's just a beautiful car. We used to have one of those in the Northwest, but uh, they are just a great looking car, lightweight as well. Down below it is one of the Disco Volantes. Um, that was from 1952. And, you know, its aerodynamics were a little bit iffy, so you didn't want to get very fast. But hey, with a 1900cc engine, it's still not going to go all that fast. It's going to be 100 or a little bit over 100. And so it's only those last 20 miles an hour that it's going that's got to scare you as the thing floats a little bit. But hey, it could live up to its flying saucer you know, name. So um, then they decided, then the new version of the company said, hey, we can do a, a Disco Volante. So the blue car here is the new Disco Volante that was produced. Now, hiding underneath the skin is an Alpha 8C. An 8C Competizione is a beautiful car. And if you're going to try to rip that body off of there and make a new one, you better do pretty well. And all in all, I. I mean, I don't, I'm not going to say anything bad about an 8C Competizione, 
but I won't complain about this either. I've seen this in person and it is a very nice looking car. So, so Super Le Touring Super Legera is still doing cool work. Um, Ital design. Uh, Gijaro. Gijaro is a phenomenal designer. Um, I, I'm probably biased. I know. Okay, I am biased. There's no doubt. But uh, th th I don't think there's a single thing that they've done that I didn't like. Even though the, even some of the things they did that were kind of having fun, tongue in cheek, I still like them. Um, this is you know the iguana. The iguana was a weird car. It's not painted. That body is a exposed metal, and the metal it is stamped with those little odd, you can't see it in the picture as well, but it's got the little texture to it. It is phenomenal to look at. Very unique, built on the Alpha Tipo 33 platform. Um, so sitting in the Alpha Museum right now, but at the same time, they did a number of other you know great cars. Now for left corner, they got the Alpha Sud Caimeno. Um, very dramatic, crazy car, show car. Um, straight below it, is one of the best looking. It's what the Porsche 914 wanted to look like. And that's the Porsche 914 Tapiro. Um, much like that Kanguro, it had a sad story. It was out for a little drive, had a little accident, caught on fire and completely burned. And they hauled it back to uh, Ital Design and it just sat there at Ital Design for years and years and years. I don't know what's become of it. I think I heard rumors that it was restored, but I've never seen a finished picture of it restored. I've only seen the old original pre-accident pictures. Um, up the upper corner, the Alpha Segura. Uh, again, completely outside the box. And I love it when designers go outside the box and they, they try something new. Is it logical? No. Does it make sense? Can we all use it? No. But Oh my God, it's fun to show people and drive around. And, and if you show up at a car show in that, I'm guaranteeing you're going to get a ton of attention. If you put it on your display stand as you're trying to sell something, it's going to bring people to your stand. So that's what it's for. Now, you know, it's weird. The, the, the glass part of the windows above you opens up like a gold wing door. And then the lower portion, the metal part, opens up like a regular door. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a very weird car. But you just got to like the fact that they're creating this thing. It's outside the box. And uh, so, so credit to Alpha, credit to uh, Ital Design for doing that. Um, down below it, the Alfa Romeo Brera. The Brera, that's the concept version. The street version of the car was almost the same. I and mean, they just changed the proportions really slightly. But they did a phenomenal job of going from a show car to a production car. And so, uh, yeah, I love that kind of stuff. I mean, and that's also a sign of a good designer. If they design something that you really are planning to use and you actually can use it, that's pretty cool. So, uh, yeah, Gujaro, Gujaro did a few things personally for me, I'm sure, because my first Alfa Romeo is that upper left corner there. And yes, that's a Gujaro design. Oh, and my first Volkswagen. Oh, right below it, Guajaro design. Hey, you know, I'm sure he did these things to say, look, I, I'm, I'm going to try to make Fred happy. If I can make Fred happy, we're going to make a lot of people happy. Uh, now, he also tried to make people smile. So they made the New York taxi as a proposal. Say, hey, we can make these little cars. Driver sits up there in front and look at how much room you got in back. And now nah, they never made more than just what, one or two. And that was it. But still, cool idea. Like. Again, like I said, outside the box. So well, that sort of is the box, come to think of it. But, uh, um, so now Gia. Gia was doing a phenomenal amount of design work. Now, what's funny about Gia is they are, you know, they're still around 107 years later. Uh, they made things like the, the Lincoln Futura that Oh, was a car show and lo a vehicle, and lo and behold, it became the Batmobile for those of us that grew up in the 60s. We remember watching that thing on TV. And, oh, that's a cool car. Man, it shot missiles and all sorts of stuff. Oh, Lord. The Lincoln Futura. Thank you, Gia. 
Uh, they did design an alpha then in the lower left corner. Uh, there's a little alpha. That's the, uh, what the heck is that thing? That's the Alpha Julieta Sport Veloce. Again, just a little test car prototype that uh, Alpha didn't go with. Um, then the Gilda. I mean, look at the Gilda. Who would design this car? It's just so dramatic. It's so crazy. But that's what designers are good at. They can have fun. They can be artistic. The Gilda is low and long. And, uh, you know, I mean, even the door handle, very dramatic door handle. So uh, to me, I just love things like that. Uh, just because it's so different. Um, and uh, Gia also made some phenomenal alphas. Uh, so I had to practice. So the, the one in the lower corner down here is the 1900 CS Speciale. Uh, it's kind of a fun car from the uh, 1954. Uh, but the one above it, the 6C2500, they only made uh, what was about a half dozen of those cars total. Um, but the car is, the word is super jewel. But uh, luckily, I, I think the way it's pronounced is super jo uh, joy, joyello, super joyello. And uh, damn Italians, they try to confuse me. But uh, anyway, that car is absolutely so beautiful. When you think of what 1950 cars look like, you know full well that if that car drove down the road in 1950 and you say you would stop what you're doing to look. Because you think of what a 1950 Chevy looked like. Think of what a 1950 anything looked like. That was a beautiful, beautiful car sitting there. So um, the trick is that, uh, you know, over the years, there's been phenomenal number of designers coming out of Italy, creating all these things. And they've had to compete against each other. They had to compete, um, you know, with, uh, you know, even the factory that's contracting them is trying to sell cars. Let's say they're selling this particular car and you make your slightly different version. Well, you know, they may, you know, they may not like this. So your version, you have to sell to them first. Then you have to have your car sitting in their showrooms, their showrooms trying to sell. It was always a, a, a difficult dance, but these guys did it over and over again. They're Italians. And you know how many times those conversations happened over lots of wine, lots of good food, and lots of lunches as they argued these things. But through the years, not all of those companies survived. Clearly, most of them did not. We still have Pin and Farina, although they design a lot more than cars. You walk into hotel lobbies, sometimes that lobby is completely designed by Pin and Farina now. You walk into a fast food place and that, that pop machine that's going to give you 35 different flavors of sugar water pop, down at the bottom, it says Pin and Farina. And you're like, damn, the high-speed rail in Italy. Hey, Pin and Farina. You know, they, that, so they're far more than cars. So I'm glad they are because that keeps them alive. Um, Ital Design got bought out by Volkswagen. There's like an 80-something percent ownership by Volkswagen. But they're still there. They're still doing what they were good at. They still practice the car design. Um, Stola is still around. They're small and kind of funny, but they're still around. Uh, they're a very specialty little company. And again, they, they specialize in doing just piecemeal work where somebody will say, hey, we want to change the front bumper on the car. Uh, what do you guys think? And they'll just do upgrades to a car. And then oh, maybe that's next year or the next year after that's version of a car. So they'll do that kind of work. Um, Zagato still around. Again, they branched out far beyond just cars. So they design buses and trucks and all sorts of things. Um, Gia, same thing. They are, you know, th there's just no way for them, these companies to survive doing just the cars the way they did for so long. I think, I think Zagato actually belongs to an Indian company, isn't it? Zagato is still owned by Zagato. It's still owned by Zagato? That maybe it's Pininfarina that's owned by the Indian company, Mahindra, I think Industries. Um, but I am glad that they're still around. But it's the it's the few and far between because most car companies now have taken on doing cars themselves. They do their own designs, their in-house style. And when you see a car comes out of uh, Chevy or comes out of Toyota, and it looks like 
just last year's Toyota, just a slight upgrade. Well, then you know, realize that they're just doing their own. It's when that car comes out looking completely different, you realize, ah, they've reached out to somebody. They've gone outside and they said, hey, I want a new fresh look at this. So it is very fun to see that. And most of them, the accountants won't let them do it. So we relish it when we see, when somebody tries something different, when somebody makes a Hyundai Veloster and you go, wow, that's crazy, but they made it. Hallelujah. I, I, I don't want to buy the car, but I enjoy the fact that somebody else does uh, because it's different. So yes, I love the design of cars. I love the old cars designs. I love you know, the exact shape of the wheel well. I love the taillights and how they did. I mean, I love all these little aspects. So I appreciate those things. And it's because of designers that have done this for years and they are true, true artisans. So when you look at your Alfa Romeo Montreal, from the inside or from the outside, yeah, you got to smile every once in a while and say thank you to the designers that, you know, Bertone that helped create that. So um, I want to also mention that in, uh, let's see, in June 11th, we have another talk and that's Alphas into the future. Um, we're going to be talking about, of course, the Alpha Tonale, but we're also going to look at what's going to be the future of uh, the Julia, what's going to be the future of the Alpha 8C or 6C, are they going to come out with one? We won't know the answers to these things, but we'll at least have fun discussing it and arguing it and talking about it on June 11th. So uh, um, let's see how we're doing on time. Um, uh, Time-wise, we are pretty much at the end of our run. So I am going to say thank you to everybody who's here and uh, appreciate everybody being part of this event and everybody for joining online or watching it at a later date. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to go to the LeMay America's Car Museum website. You can see all sorts of great things about all the uh, cars that are on display now and going forward. Thanks everybody for, for being here.